The book Man's Search for Meaning is a classic tribute to hope where the Holocaust survivor of four camps, Viktor Frankl, shares his experiences and the lessons for spiritual survival he derived from them. He also explains his psychotherapeutic method, which is oriented toward finding purpose in life. We are excited to announce the launch of the Read and Grow podcast. Now you have one more medium where you can listen to your favorite book summaries. Subscribing to our show on Apple Podcast or Spotify would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Part one of Man's Search for Meaning is dedicated to Viktor Frankl's experiences in the concentration camp. The author emphasizes that the story is not an account of facts and events. It is more of an observation of human behavior in times of great despair. According to him, there were three phases of the prisoner's mental reaction to camp life the period following his arrival, the period when he is well entrenched in camp routine, and the period following his release and liberation. The symptom that characterizes the first phase is shock. The author mentions the delusion of reprieve. The sentenced man, immediately before his execution, gets an illusion that he might be reprieved at the very last minute. Prisoners experience something similar. They believed that it wouldn't be so bad. Viktor Frankl describes the miserable conditions in the concentration camp. Not enough room for everyone, no hygiene, not enough food. All the prisoners possessed was their naked existence. They thought of two things only, how to evade the guards and how to get a little food. One of the most imperative rules of self-presentation in the camp was don't be conspicuous. The author claims that the prisoner of Auschwitz in the first phase of shock did not fear death. Even the gas chambers lost their horrors after the first few days. A man who looked miserable, sick, and emaciated, and who couldn't manage hard physical labor anymore, was a person who sooner or later went to the gas chambers. So the best advice was, shave, stand, and walk smartly. Then you need not be afraid of gas. The second emotional stage phase was dominated by apathy as a mechanism of self-defense. Prisoners experienced lack of emotion, which made them insensitive to the beatings. This insensitivity became their protective shell. The author points out that it was not the physical pain which hurt the most, but the mental agony caused by injustice. All efforts and emotions were centered on one task, preserving one's own life and that of the other fellow. The prisoner dreamed most frequently of bread cigarettes, and warm baths, which was a retreat to a more primitive form of mental life. There was also a cultural hibernation in the camp, with two exceptions, politics, conversations about military situations, and religion, in the form of improvised prayers or services. The prisoner was frightened of making decisions and taking any sort of initiative. This was a result of the apathy and of a feeling that fate was one's master. The prisoner preferred to let fate make the choice for him. Viktor Frankl was convinced that in spite of the primitiveness of life in a concentration camp, it was possible for spiritual life to deepen. He claims that people who were used to a rich intellectual life may have suffered much pain, but the damage to their inner selves was less. They were able to retreat from their terrible surroundings to a life of spiritual freedom. Thinking of his wife, the author realized the truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which man can aspire, that the salvation of man is through love and in love. He achieved fulfillment contemplating the image of his wife. The author believes that man can save remains of spiritual freedom even in such terrible conditions of psychological and physical stress. He explains that there were men who walked through the huts comforting others giving away their last piece of bread. They were few in number, but they were proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the choice of attitude. And there were always choices to be made. The sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of camp influences alone. Viktor Frankl believes that if there is a meaning in life at all, then there must be a meaning in suffering. Suffering is a part of life. 
Without suffering and death, human life cannot be complete. The way in which a man accepts his fate and all the suffering it involves gives him the opportunity to add a deeper meaning to his life. He may remain brave, dignified, and unselfish, or in the fight for self-preservation, he may forget his human dignity and become no more than an animal. The author shares that the most depressing thing for the prisoners was the fact that they didn't know how long their term of imprisonment would be. A man who couldn't see the end of his provisional existence was not able to have a goal in life. He stopped living for the future, in contrast to a man in normal life. Without a future and a goal, life became meaningless. The author thinks that people need a fundamental change of their attitude toward life. It doesn't matter what we expect from life, but rather what life expects from us. Life means taking the responsibility to find the right answer to its problems and to fulfill the tasks which are set for each person. Everyone's task is unique, and a man can only respond by being responsible. Responsibleness can require action or acceptance of fate. If suffering were avoidable, the reasonable thing to do would be to remove its cause. To suffer unnecessarily is masochistic, not heroic. But when a man finds that it is his destiny to suffer, he will have to accept his suffering as his task. Even in suffering, he is unique and alone in the universe. No one can relieve him of his suffering or suffer in his place. A man who becomes conscious of the responsibility knows the why of his existence and will be able to bear almost any how. The third stage of a prisoner's mental reactions happened after his liberation. What he felt was depersonalization. Everything appeared unreal. Bitterness and disillusion dominated when he returned to his former life. He couldn't understand how he endured it all. But, according to Frankel, the crowning experience of all was the wonderful feeling that, after all he had suffered, there was nothing he needed to fear anymore except his God. The second part of the book is dedicated to Logotherapy, a school of psychotherapy which Viktor Frankl founded. It is a meaning-centered psychotherapy which focuses on the future, on the meaning to be accomplished by the patient in his future. In Logotherapy, the patient is confronted with and reoriented toward the meaning of his life. According to Logotherapy, we can find the meaning in life in three different ways. One, by creating a work or doing a deed. Two, by experiencing something, goodness, truth, beauty, or encountering someone by loving another human being. And three, by the attitude we take toward unavoidable suffering. When we are not able to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. According to the author, man's main concern is not to gain pleasure or to avoid pain, but rather to find a meaning in his life. Viktor Frankl firmly believes that a human being is ultimately self-determining. In the camps, he witnessed people behaving like pigs while others behaved like saints. Man has both potentialities within himself. Which one is actualized depends on decisions and not on conditions. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to watch our summary of Ryan Holiday's book, The Obstacle is the Way. Thank you.